My name is Blair. I'm our community engagement uh, manager here at Prison Yoga Project. And we are starting our new series today called Healing Harm, where we bring in professionals in the transformative justice sector. And we have Sue Radcliffe today joining us and Director Hughes. Um, I'll start and give some formal introductions as well. Uh, we're also streaming live on Facebook. So hello, Facebook world. Thank you so much for joining us here today. Um, I, I know that these bios won't actually do justice to the two guests that we have here today. Um, I really feel like they have walked their whole professional lives um, in service of others. So we really feel honored to have both of you here today as our guests. Um, we'll start with Director Hughes. Uh, director Hughes uh, became director in 2017, and he has since implemented practices in his jail, such as family-friendly visitation areas, extended visitation for children, an accredited GED program, and a position of re-entry coordinator. He Im implemented medical assistance treatment for people currently incarcerated in the county's detention center and those being released. Uh, including much more programs that we're going to talk about today. Um, so thank you so much, Director, for joining us. You're welcome. And we have Susan Radcliffe, who's a licensed children's social worker and a registered, uh, a registered yoga teacher as well. She earned her master's of social work at Yeshiva University. She is a trauma-informed trained mental health therapist with the Dorchester County Health Department and Connecting for Success it's a program located in Cambridge, Maryland. This program provides services for children and impacted families by incarceration via mental health treatment and programming in detention centers. Sue, thank you so much for joining us here today. Thank you, it's an honor to be here. Um, so I'll go over the agenda a little bit and then Sue is gonna bring us in through an, a centering exercise. So how we usually uh, do our programming is we have about a 40 minute casual discussion uh, between Sue, uh, Director Hughes and myself, and then we'll invite the audience to come in with their questions. Um, we open the floor first to anyone who has been directly impacted by incarceration. And we actually uh, open the floor for you to ask your questions directly. So if you've been impacted by incarceration, you're gonna be able to um, raise your hand. If you look at the Zoom bar at the bottom, uh, if you raise your hand, we'll be able to call you and unmute you and you'll be able to verbally ask your question. And then we'll move on to an open Q&A, which you'll be able to write your question in the Q&A box. Um, and thank you, Nicole, our assistant director. She's also moderating the chat and moderating the chat on Facebook today. So if you guys have any questions in the meantime, you're welcome to pop on there and she will answer those for you. Um, so thanks for this little housekeeping. And Sue, I would love for you to take it away and lead us in a centering opportunity. Awesome, I would love to do this. All right, well, we're gonna take about five to seven minutes just to start off. Um, those of you wanna join, I invite you to, if you're not feeling it today, that is okay. Go get a cup of tea or a cup of coffee and we'll be done in about five to seven minutes. So why don't we just start in a seated position and if it feels comfortable to you, you can close your eyes or you might wanna just have a soft gaze looking down at the floor and just start to breathe and take a breath on whatever way feels comfortable to you. And just take a moment to just kind of notice the thoughts that are coming in and out of your head. Just see if you can resist the temptation just to grab onto that thought and toss it around. Instead, just to kind of let it go, like you're just watching a cloud go by on one side and then out the other. And continue your focus on your breath, just noticing your chest as it rises up and down. As you take a deep breath in and a nice slow exhale out. And if you'd like, you might even want to pay attention to what part of the body is touching on the chair or wherever you're seated. And see if you can notice every single part of your back, your backside, 
and even your thighs and legs and feet on the floor. And just pay attention to that tiny little pressure that you can feel when you're seated in a chair. And focus on your breath. You may even want to experiment with activating that vagus nerve by taking a deep breath in through your nose and bringing that breath into your belly, popping that belly out. And then have a nice, slow exhale, just like you're blowing out a candle. And if it feels comfortable to you and you'd like to join us, you can take that breath again for two more times. Deep breath in through your nose, pop that belly out. And a nice, slow exhale, like you're blowing out a candle. On your next breath, you might even want to visualize your belly being like a big balloon as you take that deep breath in. And on the exhale, just kind of notice how your belly deflates. And you can continue with that breath or resume your normal way of, of breathing that feels comfortable to you, whatever feels good in your body this morning. We're gonna take a moment just to kind of notice our shoulders. Just pay attention to any tension that you might be holding there or around your neck. And if you'd like, you can take a deep breath in, lift up those shoulders to the ears and on the exhale, roll those shoulders down your back. And we'll do that for two more times. Deep breath in, bring the shoulders up to your ears. And on the exhale, roll them down your back. And one more time, deep breath in, shoulders up. Exhale, roll them down your back. And just come to stillness. Just notice what part of your body is talking to you. Notice if your shoulders feel a little less stressed and a little less tense. Notice if there's any changes in your neck. And also notice if you've kind of released any tension in your face that may have been there when we started a few minutes ago. And just breathe. And then whenever you're ready, you can slowly start to make some tiny movements in your fingers, maybe some turning of the wrists. Just pay attention if you have any cracks and pops that might be happening. And you can slowly, if you want, have those tiny movements come into some bigger movements, maybe some extension of the arms, movement of the shoulder. <laughs> and then whenever you're ready, slowly open your eyes. And just pay attention to the room. Kind of notice if you see um, two different colors. Notice if you hear anything on the outside. And then welcome back to the webinar. So thank you all for being a part of that. I appreciate, appreciate your last five to seven minutes being with me. Thank you so much, Sue. You're welcome. Yeah, um, I mean, I feel like there's two benefits of doing the centering. One, it's for all of us that are being uh, in the interview too, right? Um, mm -hmm. Kind of gives us an example of some of the work that we offer to the people that we serve. So again, thank you so much for being here. Um, and I think that we can use that as our first question or opportunity. And I would love to direct this at Director Hughes. Um, what is your first memory or experience of yoga or mindfulness? So my first one was when I walked by the parenting class that Sue and another social worker do for the males. Um, and they had the spears and they would, that's how they would learn their breathing techniques. and. So I was like, okay, let me see. I, this is going to be interesting because they're not going to do this. And I walked by and I was just watching. 
And every single one of them was doing the breathing techniques with the spears. And I said, okay, maybe maybe there is something to this. So uh, Sue kept getting on me. I said, well, we'll try it. And then, so yeah, that was my first experience with, you know, seeing it and just that all the, that the people in the class were all, had to all joined in and they were all participating. They all did along, get, went along too. So I love that you had already said yes to this kind of work and that you didn't really have any experience with it, yeah, yeah. Um, which I think speaks to really both of you. Sue, I think that speaks to how you can bring this work into a facility um, and really communicate this work. And then also Director Hughes, just your openness of just being like, yeah, you know, I we really want to try something different here. So thank you for sharing that story. You're welcome. And Sue, what was your first experience or memory of yoga or mindfulness? Oh boy, it was 20 plus years ago when I took a yoga class at the gym and I have just continued with a, a practice um, since then. Um, I never ever dreamed or thought of or wanted to be a yoga instructor. Um, that was not what I had envisioned myself doing, definitely not five years ago. But um, as more of the research came out about the benefits of yoga and especially with trauma, so that not only do you physically feel good, but you feel your, you know, your limbic system of your brain feels good. Um, you know, there was just no way that I could, could not pursue um, this form of practice and, and to give it to those as, that definitely need it. And especially in a place like an incarcerated setting where it's really difficult to be vulnerable and open up. Um, you can work on, you know, some of the issues of the past just by a practice. And I just thought that was phenomenal. That's beautiful, thank you. And when did you do your yoga teacher training? Will you talk about that journey as well and how maybe you found the perfect fit for you? Sure. Well, it all started in about 2016. I worked for our local health department and we um, received a new grant. And um, with that becomes, you know, it came about new money for training. And I had mentioned something to Director Hughes, like now that we're starting to come into your facility, like, what do you need? And um, he said, we need anger management stuff. And so I thought, oh, I got just the thing. So um, my supervisor, Mindy and I approached the director at the health department, say, listen, we gotta be trained in yoga. This, we have to, <laughs> um, because this is, this is something that's going to be big and also super helpful and beneficial. So in 2017, um, I did my RIT training in um, Baltimore and you know pitched it to director hughes like hey what do we what do you think about this and prior to that um i i asked him can we please train all your correctional officers on why we're doing this because it's something so not um thought about in our community as as something to bring into an incarcerated setting and um that's really the thing that that spiraled um the rest of our research and our program that we've developed. So, you know, kudos to Director Hughes because I I don't think a lot of other um, wardens around. If some little social worker said, "Hey, I want to bring yoga," you know, um, to the facility, you know, that they would have been as open-minded as he is. And I feel like that really speaks to also Director Hughes of really knowing the people that you serve as well. Like what does your community in this facility need, right? And so maybe the need was so desperate that you really were open to trying anything. Um, and then I think I kind of want to go into this overarching view as well. You know, you guys have really created so much opportunity within your facility. And I think there's two aspects that we're working here. Um, Director Hughes, I know that you had said that you have worked at this facility for the past 25 years and that you've kind of worked your way through all of these different positions, which I think really gives you a unique perspective on the needs of this community, um, as well as that you're in a rural community. So I know that both of you have been working with generations upon generations of people that you've served and then also that you know the people that you serve. Um, so you really have this unique opportunity um, to break these cycles. 
Um, and so, which is also kind of why we invited you guys here today because you're creating a new culture. And Director Hughes, will you talk more about this culture shift that you wanted to implement at your facility? Right, so as you said, I've been in here for 25 years um, and I've gone through working on like third generations of people that's been coming through the facility and it's just like, what can we do to change it? Something, something has to change. And uh, so that was one of the main things. So in a rural community like we are, you have a drug problem and you have a, a assault problem, a, a anger problem really, where the, where the guys just, just didn't know how to deal with anger. And the, the way to deal with anger is to, to fight or to push out. And so we knew that that's one of the areas that we could try to fix. Um, and that's why when me and Sue would sit down and talk, we would go over, you know, different things. And one of, that was one of the things that we said we, we needed some for anger management. And, and so, and it's still today, it's, it's the same charges that we get people in here. And, and since we started the program, I weren't sure how it was going to go either. So, but it's like the high, everybody wants to get into the program. We have waiting lists to try to get into the, the program. So, and it was because the guys that were coming back from their, their yoga class and going back to the, to the pods, they were going back telling everybody how they felt and how it was working on them. So it kind of like, like mushroomed out where now the other ones were, you know, getting into it too. And like you said about communicating, they would communicate where, where things that you would never talk about with um, trauma for the males, where they would write me a letter saying, could they have a class where they, the ones that had trauma could get together and, and talk. And, and so th would that, that would have never happened before. Wow. So I'm hearing that even your openness to bringing these programs in created almost a ripple effect of openness. Um, and Sue coming in and offering these programs. And so just creating a, just a little opportunity for vulnerability and safety has really changed your whole facility. Yeah. And so like Sue said, so we implemented, we were going to do the class for the inmates. And then we said, well, let's tell the officer. So I said, well, let's do the admin staff first because the officers wouldn't come back and complain to me about anything. They would go to the admin staff and complain. And I wanted them to know why we were doing it, what was gonna be done and everything. And so my admin staff, once they had the class, they all they all went into it too. So we had, I had my admin and me together. So we kind of like, you know, and then we brung the COs in. And it just went from there to the point where we, were, we would do it as a, a in-service class to a point where they wanted to do extra classes. So they would set up with Sue their own time so they could do it because they liked how it was helping them. So. Which is amazing. And like I was saying, I feel like we could have you on here several times because there really is so much that you have, you have offered for your community. Sue, so will you kind of go over the timeline of all of the programs that you started implementing and kind of how all of this expanded? Sure, happy to. So in 2016 is when, you know, we first started going into the facility and we found that Director Hughes noted that the need was for, you know, anger management. So in 2017, you know, I got my RYT 200 and immediately the weekend after I went to Omega and studied with the Prison Yoga Project um, because I wanted those um, beautiful like trauma informed language and style to just be totally into my, my brain. Um, so that was when I uh, asked Director Hughes prior to having any sort of program for those that are incarcerated, could we first train all the officers? Um, and I am a brain geek. I love neuroscience. And I also know that officers want to know the why. Why is this working? Why are we bringing this in? So I developed, I think it was about an hour, an hour and a half program of the why. 
Um, this is what it is. This is how it'll help your brain. Um, this is how it will help you if you have your own practice. And then this is how it's going to help you if we bring it into those who are incarcerated. You know, less infractions, decrease in anger and irritability, um, things like that. So that went over really, really well. And that's where it was really neat because I remember um, Director Hughes saying, wow, I didn't know that's why I think the way I do, you know, um, because of the damage to the brain. So then in 2018, Director Hughes mandated all of his correctional officers to participate in a year, um, um, a year program or uh, annual program of a uh, trauma-informed yoga practice, as well as the lecture um, about the why and why it's good for them, why it's good for those incarcerated, you know, um, the neuroscience and the ACEs and things behind that. Um, that initially was really interesting. My favorite excuse was an officer couldn't be there because they, he had to pick up his grandma on the side of the road. I thought that was great. Um, but we kept pre and post data um, from that. And then we published them in 2019 in an American jail article because after they experienced um, the information of the changes that happened to the brain during yoga and meditation and then actually participated in a class, it's like they got it. Yeah. Um, 2019, Director Hughes put me on the agenda for the something called the Warden's Roundtable, and that's done in the state of Maryland where all the wardens come together, um, I believe quarterly, right, Director Hughes, um, to talk about issues, and it got, you know, a lot of great feedback, like, wow, we didn't know this. You know. Um, it also just helped make things so much easier, because then we brought in, you know, the program for those that are incarcerated, and um, there wasn't that teasing that was done by the staff. Um, it was more, oh, you better watch out. Miss Sue's had a lot of coffee today. You know, might be an interesting class. Yeah. And then throughout um, the years, what I did is I developed a program for those that are incarcerated. It's a six week program and they get a watered down version on the neuroscience um, of why we do, why we're doing trauma informed yoga. And we also talk about like ACEs. We talk also um, about, you know, different techniques and things that you can do to calm down, why we do the certain breathing that we do, um, and really explains the why. So 2020, um, Director Hughes sent, sent me away <laughs> to a week-long training so that I could provide more than a three-hour class um, to a facility. Um, because I'm a civilian. And then um, in July of 2020, we connected with a researcher, a criminologist, Dr. Hayden Smith from University of South Carolina. And we studied our program. We studied the three hour, per, the three hour lecture plus um, hour and a half yoga um, class with the CEOs. And the results were crazy. And they're being written up right now to look at um, publication. So that's kind of what has happened. So what's gonna happen hopefully is that more uh, research will be done on the importance of having um, a wellness program for officers. And if you look at it, um, you know, the program's approached in a way where this is how it's gonna help you. This is how it's gonna help you if it's at your facility. And this is how it's gonna help um, those individuals in the facility. So a big win, win, win. Um, and I know I just went on a really long tangent of the timeline, <laughs> but that's kind of like what has happened um, with us in the last several years. That's what I wanted. I wanted the long time. <laughs> it's, it's great, right? And so I think, I feel like there's even a couple more things in there that you guys had done in between too. Um, will you talk about the results? Um, will you talk about, and maybe I'll direct this at Director Hughes first. What are these internal shifts that you've seen from the starting of you really being the director until now implementing these programs? So there's two different ones. So with the one with the inmates, um, I, I can tell you that the medical department and the mental health department came to me afterwards and they were surprised at the effects it had on the guys because there was guys that were taking, that were taking pain medicine or, different medicines that 
they didn't need no more. And they, they were ones that was always taking these pain medicine and they were, they were just surprised. And, and just the attitude of some of them coming up and seeing the, the mental health uh, person that he told me he was surprised. And, and so, you know, that's a, and so how we done it was it, we met, we had a team. So it was like myself, my classification officer, um, my medical, mental health, and my chief of security. And we would, at first, the first couple classes, we would pick the inmates that we that we thought needed it. So medical would say this person needed it because medical, mental health, we would have some inmates that were aggressive. We would, hey, let's put this guy in there and see how it works. And, and so that worked great. And then we would get with Sue and she had no problems with any of the, the, the guy. When we actually, when we first started it, we called it anger management, mindful movement, because we said, well, the guys ain't going to sign up if we say we have in yoga classes. And so we called it that, but the inmates just took off and said, I want the yoga class. So we just let, you know, we can still call it, but they know what it is. So. It got so big, Blair, that um, there was at one point like over 75 people on the waiting list and we're a small, like at the max, what about 250 people in the facility? We called it the draft. So we would get everybody Absolutely. together, you know, because I shouldn't be deciding who goes in the class. Everybody knows the, um, their population the best. And um, <clears throat> excuse me, we would have the draft <laughs> um, to see who are the next participants. Yeah, because we could only put so many in there at a time. So once they would put the request slips and we'd go through the draft. I also like that, I feel like there's a different approach that you took as well, that it wasn't necessarily based on merit, it was based on need. Right. And, and what, what, what was that decision? How did, you, how did you come to that conclusion? Well, and it was just part of the, <laughs> the same thing like I was talking about before. I, I, I started off on the floor, so I worked the floor for, for 20 years almost. So I know a lot of the guys. So and the classification knows them. So we knew what needs, who was having this problems were that we thought if, if we could just get fixed one little thing with them, that it was a chance that they might not come back because our recidivism rate was like 70%, 75% higher sometimes. So, you know, and then it just had something had to change. So that's what we would just pick who we thought was the best fit. And what's your recidivism right now? Have you, do you have uh, numbers since implementing the programs? So I, I know it's going down now. It's like uh, 60, well, last time I checked was 60, 61 or 2%. Um, Amazing. Which is, yeah. 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 Congratulations really on, on just, I think it's I think it's brave to step outside of the normal aspects of maybe how you would run a prison or a jail. You know, there is there is a risk in choosing different ways to operate. And you've done that and you've done it with great success. And I think that you've actually done it that you're gonna be trailblazers, right? That it just keeps building and that you're creating um, almost like a packet for other people to replicate, for other facilities to replicate. Um, so Sue, will you talk about the transformation that you've really seen when you come into the facility, maybe from once you started till to now? So it's been really neat, um, you know, to kind of be a part of a process where you bring something new and non-traditional in and just watch and see what happens. Um, so initially, you know, the reaction of having yoga at the facility was are you kidding me? <laughs> you know, <laughs> um, that, you know, from the officers, which totally understand because, you know, they didn't know the why behind it. Um, I have really enjoyed like the light bulb moments um, in the uh, annual correctional officer wellness program that, you know, we do that involves them being a part of a trauma informed yoga class. You know, I go over the statistics and how hard their job is and just acknowledging like, you know, your work, the work that you do is so valuable and it's also really hard and we get that. Um, and that has been like, a, you know, like, whoo, 
woo, you know, um, I almost feel, and Director Hughes, you can chime in and help me with this, that like nobody's ever said that before, you know, that we know that you have a really hard um, job. And then I approach it from a very scientific perspective using a lot of data um, and also, you know, information about the brain and the limbic system and the damage that just their daily activities day after day, month after month, year after year has had, you know, on their life. Um, and um, to have to know that, you know, hey, somebody cares about you and what's happening and here's some way that you can approach it. And we care about our community and those that are in on the inside. And this is why we're there to help them. Um, that's just, it's just been really neat. Um, but I know that I just am being on other uh, PYP series and hearing things that you hear a lot about just a lot of the resistance, you know, from people coming in um, to offer this kind of program. And I hadn't, I haven't, uh, you know, really felt that after the training of the correctional officers, you know, they get it. Um, in fact, now it's even funny because they'll say, oh, we got a new one in last night. He needs yoga, you know, <laughs> um, and he better be on the top of your list, you know, that sort of thing. And, and, and that's such a, a cool cultural change. And the fact that, um, you know, the officers have asked Director Hughes, can we have Sue come in once a month, you know, to give us a yoga class? Um, and he has graciously um, allowed that to be done work during work time, which is super amazing, you know, um, is just a strong testament to how, um, the belief um, and the feelings that they have um, from a program like this. So, so that's my light bulbs. <laughs> yeah, like Sue said, we didn't know why we thought we did what we did um, the way we did. We just thought, you know, it's just the way it's normal because we've done it for years and we've we felt this way and we never knew why. And, and like she said, when she teaches the brain, you know, the officers are like, you can say what you want. I, I'm really not going to believe much what you say. And you have to show me, I have to be able to see why it's going to make a difference. And, and when we go over the brain and, and you talk about, you know, the effects of everything and then you do the class and then you start feeling different. It, it, they can see it, so that's what we, another way that they bought it in because they felt the diff, they felt the difference. And um, I like that it's this it's uh, it's show me, don't tell me, show me. So it's just another kind of different aspect. And um, Director Hughes, I would also love to ask, what was the mental health training that maybe you had when you first started your job, or what was offered at your facility prior to um, Sue's programming? Yeah, there was nothing. There was no, nothing for the officers. Um, we would have a mental health person here like once a week and, and that was it. And so that was one of the things we, we brought in was mental health seven days a week. Um, and then, you know, and Sue will tell you, so like they also do with the parenting class, they'll bring in, we bring in the kids and we, we, uh, I got with a, a local private school that donated books for the kids. And so for one, for Christmas, a lot of times we had them, they did books. So we would go to the inmates that had children or nieces or nephews, and we would let them pick out three books and we would wrap it up for them and send it out to the things. And, and so, you know, just bring, getting the kids involved was a big thing too. And we were supposed to have, um, for those that uh, completed the six week course, um, those that are incarcerated, a parent child yoga class. Um, Director Hughes is gonna allow us to um, have one on a Sunday afternoon um, and then COVID hit. <laughs> and so hopefully now that things are coming down a little bit um, with COVID um, that we can do that for those that have you know, completed the six weeks and um, have a parent-child um, yoga class, which could just be awesome, wouldn't it? I mean, I just think that'd be neat. It will be, I already know, it will be absolutely amazing. Yeah. It will be totally amazing. And we'll have to have you back on again and kind mm -hmm. of talk about how, how it's going. Mm -hmm. um, and I feel like I want to put a pin in COVID because I want to talk about that next. 
but I, I would say on this, um, on this family and, and children orienting. Um, so maybe Sue, we can start with you. I know, I think that I misspoke. You're a licensed clinical social worker, not children's social worker. Okay, okay, great. But you do work with children. You do Correct. a lot of work with mental health with children. Correct. Um, so will you talk about some of the programming or maybe some of the motivation for involving families in the work that you do? Well, it's just crucial. I mean, if you pull up any data, you can see that, um, you know, not having contact um, with the, the parent-child contact when a parent is incarcerated is just horrible, um, not only for the child, but also for, for the adult. So uh, in the program that I work with, I work with three other fabulous women. Um, we work at trying to keep, maintain, sustain relationships. So, you know, I provide mental health services at a local elementary school where we work on, you know, writing letters, setting up with other facilities if it isn't in our, our own community in Dorchester, um, phone calls, you know, contact. We have a re a entry workers, fabulous Lavanya and Jan, who do a lot of work with helping parents, uh, you know, as they try to get out, when they get out, get jobs, helping them with bonding, getting birth certificates, IDs, thing, things like that. We offer a parenting class on the inside and then also on the outside, which um, Mindy, our supervisor, facilitates uh, to help support parents because a lot of times um, they might have a mandate that they have to have a parenting class prior to even seeing their kids. So all the little things that add barriers in order to be successful when you when you get out or as you approach to get out, we try to help with as well as any of the gaps in communication um, for parents that might be on the inside for quite a long um, period of time. We really come from a, a perspective that you can still parent um, from the inside and that you are still super duper important um, to your kid, kids and their health and their mental health, um, even though you might be coming from a different place and not living with them directly. Wow. And um, Director Hughes, will you talk about your decision of starting to bring in more family oriented work. I know that you even um, rehabbed or redid your waiting room to make it more trauma informed. So will you just talk about what you implemented and why you felt it was important? Yeah, well, family's important. Um, and talking with Sue and, and the parenting class, one of the things we did was once they completed the parenting class, we never told anybody um, that they would do it because if they didn't want to be involved in parenting class, they are very strict. And, you know, if you're not going to be involved and work at it, you're going to not be in the class. So when they completed the class, we would, I, uh, I allowed their children to come in on a Sunday. We would put them into the gym and, and we talked to the kids. One of them would talk to the, the children before they came in and they would talk to them after when they came out and the same way with the inmate, they talked to the inmate before, you know, to go over like the parenting skills they were taught. And that's what we went in there and, and uh, said, you know, this is go in here, we're gonna bring your kids, learn your parent, teach your kids the stuff you learn in the parenting class. So, and that worked great. I, I, I actually, the, the day it was going on, I told Sue, I said, like five minutes before it was supposed to end, I said, I'm leaving now because I'm not going to be here at the end because I, I could see uh, some people upset, but it never happened. It, it went great. Um, after they came out, they talked to the kids, like how they make them feel. They talked to the inmate, how they felt about how everything went on. And so that was great. Um, but as far as the lobby, so I had a, we had an inmate, I went back. I said, anybody can draw or paint pictures? And this one inmate says, yeah, I can. I said, here, draw it on a piece of paper. So he drew, this, he drew a, a picture on a piece of paper. I said, all right, I got a job for you. So I brought him up front. We painted the lobby. I said, I need some pictures, some cartoon uh, uh, put up here. And he said, all right. He said, well, give me, he, I said, give me a list of what you need. So we got all the paint he needed. And I thought he was going to sketch something now. He just grabbed his paintbrush and went on and, and 
they look really great. I mean, I, and we put a little carpet up there and put a table for the kids to cra uh, color and read books while they're waiting. And we encourage the kids to take one of the books into the visitation with and read the book to their parent. So we were trying to get the communication with the kids and they're not just, hey, you know, to prove, you know, look, look, look dad or look mom, I can read and because some of them are young kids. So that was, uh, that worked good too. Wow, and kind of bonding through um, missed milestones, right? It's yeah. like the parents of people that, uh, when the parents are incarcerated, they're missing these moments. Uh, so I really love this kind of uh, autonomy opportunity, right? That you're making the children feel comfortable when they're visiting their parent. Um, I think that's important too, because maybe if the child is feeling uncomfortable, they're gonna keep that distance, right? They're gonna keep that. So really creating a warm atmosphere when they're visiting a parent um, you're, you're almost, you're like, uh, lowering the opportunities of trauma that might be possibly happening. Right. It's really, um, staying on this, this bonding moment, really seeing it as an opportunity and taking that opportunity. All right. Amazing. And then we do like once a month, Sue, and, and they would all come in and have coffee for the parents and donuts and stuff and put stuff coloring out for the kids to do. And they would talk to them and let the parents, let them know what we're doing also. They would talk to the parents saying, you know, we're, your husband's in one of my classes and, and you know, we're talking. And, and so, and then even then I, I, a couple of my officers would walk out front for something and they would see the kids and, and you could see the, the difference in the officers being more involved in, you know, not just the guys are in here for whatever, but they're also still a parent. So that's the main thing too. It sounds like really bringing this, this human and compassionate quality to your facility. And it's like, it, it's, uh, it's this container that you've really created, um, which is making it safer for everyone, right? Like that's this whole point of, of corrections is for public safety. And I feel like you're actually doing that in your facility. Um, yeah. so first, thank you. And I can tell you my numbers went down with, with, uh, assaults and everything in the back. So it all, everything went down. So yeah. Just and I, think I, that's, I would love to, to, to transition into some, some numbers and results of this research that you guys have been, um, doing and showing up for, um, maybe Sue, you want to start us off and you guys can kind of just go back and forth of sharing some of the results that are going to be published soon. Sure. So this is the study um, what we did with, again, Dr. Hayden Smith from University of South Carolina. And what we studied was the, um, the wellness program, which encompassed a three hour um, lecture followed by about an hour, an hour and a half of a trauma informed yoga class. And all of um, the correctional officers and administrative staff participated with the exception of one, but that's still an amazing rate. Uh, so some of the results, 98% um, said they gained an understanding of how the brain reacts to stress and that being irritable and grouchy and not sleeping are just normal reactions to stress. Also 98% recommended, said that they would recommend the class to the other staff. Um, also 98% we would recommend it to those that are incarcerated. 100% agreed that breathing can calm down your body and your brain. And after the yoga class, 98% said they felt less stress. 96% had positive emotions about yoga and meditation. And 100% felt that the yoga class had a positive impact on their emotional well being. That is just like huge. 96% reported that they felt less irritated and agitated. Um, and we had some open ended questions like, did you see a change in your way of thinking after this training? And if so, how? Um, some of them said, yes, it freed me. Um, that there's a way to find clarity and focus even in the midst of difficulties. Um, it gives me a chance to think before I act. And I'm like, that's so cool. Um, my mind went to a peaceful place and I didn't think about anything but releasing the stress. Um, and after the open-ended question of, do you have any suggestions? 
And they said, yes, we'd like more of these. And I thought, this is awesome. So, you know, if this is the sentiment of the correctional officers, um, then for those that are incarcerated, you know, it just trickles down. And I know um, Director Hughes, after the class, always liked to watch people as they left. Um, because everybody was kind of like, you know, that beautiful yoga zoned out bliss that you have. Um, they would walk out just like, whoa. <laughs> One of the officers said, I think I just got in touch with my Native American heritage after one of the classes. And that just was like, oh, that's so cool. Um, so yeah, that's the study that um, hopefully will be published um, in, the, in the next um, several months. We had great results also um, when we studied the program with uh, um, those that are incarcerated. These are published in the American Jail article. 98% um, of those that are incarcerated reported that, it helped, that yo the yoga class helped them feel calm. 98% um, said that they'd recommend it to anybody else in the detention center. 88% said that it helped them sleep better. And then 80% said that it helped them with ways to manage their angry feelings. And I thought, those are pretty good. Um, so it's just, you know, it's the street cred to show that what we've all, all known, you know, for years that it does work. It does work. Mm -hmm. Wow. There's some of the statistics. I don't know, Director Hughes, if you have any specific ones. No, I just... So I, I had one where the inmate walked down the hall and I passed me in the hall, one of the corridor areas. And he said, Hughes, man, you've been proud of me. I said, why? He said, he said, I used my breathing techniques. He said, I used to, I would have fought them last time, but I didn't fight them this time. <laughs> I said, that's good. So yeah, so it's just, but it's things like that. And like the officers. So I have some that are, are uh, weightlifters and they were like, Oh, I'm not into yoga. I'm into weightlifting. That's what I do to get rid of my stress until they did the yoga class and then were, it, it changed. Them. <laughs> so. And Director Hughes, I know that you had spoken to it just a little bit before I had asked the last question, but yeah, will you see, will you tell us more about the lowering numbers of maybe fights or um, penalties or talk about the the kind of the internal cultural shift that maybe happened with the correctional officers and or the people incarcerated. Yeah, so I don't have the numbers right in front of it. I know the first the first year everything went down fifty percent, and the next year it went down even farther. So yeah, it continued to go down um, until COVID until COVID hit, and now we we struggle with getting in here for this, but. You know, as soon as we can get it going again, I'm sure all the numbers will start coming back down again. So. And, and that just shows it worked because once we couldn't do it, then, you know, they, with COVID, they were upset anyway. So it was just made everything a little worse. But And how are you guys opening back up again? Where are you right now as far as COVID restrictions? So right now we're still... Don't have any. Well, we're starting to do classes now, and then uh, and we'll open up with the uh, parenting class again, probably starting in June, and then um, and then starting to open up everything now. So it's all starting to open up up again. We try to separate as much as possible, um, so we'll probably keep like everybody that's in. Um, uh, addictions class would be in one pod so we can keep them together you know yoga classes will be in another pod or parenting classes will be another so we can keep them separate as much as possible but yeah we're gonna we'll get ready to start opening back up now that's great that's really good to hear that uh program will be able to start coming back up um and maybe i would love to hear you touch on um how this really affected your staff and the people that you serve in this community. Um, you know, you really were, were, I feel like you were kind of at, hitting your stride, right? Of all these programs and really creating this community feel. And then what did that feel like um, to have that all stop? So yeah, so that was like a punch in the gut really, tell you the truth. <laughs> um, just because, you know, 
the community was starting to get involved. I was getting more people in the community involved, uh, more people wanting to come in to, to uh, run more programs and stuff. So, you know, that because because how this program had worked and then we were talking to uh, the art center in town, they were going to come here for the females and do an art uh, trauma art class and stuff. And, and so it all kind of shut down, but, but before that, yeah, it was getting everybody involved. I mean, the, the guys would even be talking to, so when visitation would come, I would hear about it then too. And they'd be telling me how different their, their significant other was, you know, even just talking to them on the phone, they could see a difference in them. So they're like, keep it up before you send them home, you know, but, you know, <laughs> but yeah. Wow. Um, I'm, I'm sure that the community will continue to rally behind you, especially with new things opening and everything that you've done. Um, you know, maybe it will be a, even another opportunity for more people to come, especially the last year of what we've really been seeing about, um, wanting to really heal our communities and what our responsibility is to the people around us. Um, so, yeah. yeah. I think that that was coming together, especially when the officers were, were coming out for the cookies and don or donuts and coffee, where they were talking to the families and getting involved with everything too. So, yeah, because they live all, they all live in the same community. Most of the people here, that work here are from this community. So we all grown up together and we grown, you know, six or seven of the guys here I graduated high school with. So, you know, that's how close it is. And like you knew their parents and their parents, oh, yeah. their parents right? Yeah. So it's this really, um, that's why I think that you, you have such a, a unique opportunity and such a unique story. Um, you know, before I had spoken with Sue, I had never really thought of a rural jail and the, um, the different needs that a rural community really needs uh, and that you have shown up for your community in this way. And you're like, actually, this is about all of us. Um, this is really about all of us healing together and creating all of these different opportunities for that to happen. Right. And it was just uh, different groups on the outside that were willing to come in and and be a part and want to help and, and do stuff that really is supportive, you know, because it takes everybody together to do everything because, you know, every inmate and has a different problem. So you have to, you can't put them all in the same category. You have to work with each one separate. And that's what the, the uh, re-entry person does with too. She helps try to get that going along so they, you know, because the guys would tell me, said, don't, don't release me without a plan or, or don't, I, I have to have structure. They like the structure, but if you just put me back, I'm going back to the same place. So, you know, don't, if you're, if I'm going to go to a program, don't make it next week, make it the day I leave so I can get in. And, and so, because they don't want to take a chance because they don't, they know their self that if they, they're going to fall fail again so they want to support so that part of the re-entry is to try to help facilitate that where everything's set up for them when they get on the outside they have their metal medical their housing and everything so and then like uh, mediation you know before they get out with their family so they know what to expect because you know they've been out of the fam been out of the house for a year two years it, you know, you're going back into it. It's a different situation from when you left. So they try to bring it all together before they go home. So it's all about helping them succeed because, you know, if they don't come back, that's great for me too. So. And I hear the quality that is arising is, is actually listening. It's radical listening and that you're looking at ind every individual's life and saying, what do you need? Right. And, and that you're you're doing something about that. It's, there's, a, there's a listening aspect here that I really see coming forth. So thank you. No problem. Yeah. Um, I, I, I would love to transition into our audience and start to ask some questions. Um, so uh, again, we, if you've been directly impacted by incarceration, we like to give you the 
first. And how you can do that is you can raise your hand and I see someone's hands raised. I'll just give this for everyone else again. Uh, you can raise your hand, we'll call and we'll unmute you and then you'll be able to ask your question directly. Um, uh, we have Laura. I'm gonna allow you to come in and you can unmute yourself and uh, ask your question. Thank you so much, Laura. Hi, I'm traveling right now, so I hope you can hear me. Yes, we can. Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, so first of all, I wanna thank you, Director Hughes and Sue for your work. I have a son who's incarcerated and um, a young adult son and he's in a, we're in Massachusetts. So he's in, um, he's in a jail. He spent a, a few years in a forensic hospital before unfortunately he was discharged to jail. So that's the way the laws are here. And he's not, you know, um, that's something that I'm, needs to change, <laughs> but, um, so I, I have, I've, I'm part of a, a local advocacy group um, and we are excited. I'm, I'm gonna be meeting with my group this week and I'm, I'm so excited to learn about the programs you're putting in place, Director Hughes and Sue for your um, input into that um, because we are seeking for ideas on suggestions we can have for holistic treatment models in jail. So, um, I, I, you mentioned like sort of like this concept of having a packet for other facilities. So I guess I would be super interested in any resources you could put together. And I know you've got your research articles there that I think would also be great to be able to present to, I don't know. I guess I, I, guess I would like to know what would your, what do you feel the first steps are to try to recommend um, a holistic model of, of treatment in, in um, local jails because in it's it's kind of hard because they're they're run by different counties um not like the state so um we're advocating in various places but jail definitely is one of them so my question would be um what resources would you recommend what first steps would you recommend and then um i also just want to say that my son's jail prison yoga project has been in there and um there, you know, I think there's a, a, a yoga instructor waiting for COVID to open things back up and they, they do plan to go back to the facility. So I'm super excited about that. Um, and I'd like to also just, if you could mention briefly, what do you describe, how would you describe yoga informed, trauma informed yoga? So first part questions about advocacy and then how would you describe um, trauma informed yoga? Sorry, that's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll go ahead and start um, if that's okay with you, Director Hughes. First of all, thank you for your question. Um, welcome. It, it's interesting because your question relates a lot to conversations that Director Hughes and I have had about how were we able to make this so successful. And definitely um, the administrative buy-in is essential. And I'll let Director okay. Hughes talk a little bit more about that in a moment. But, um, that's absolutely essential because, you know, you have a system where it trickles down from the top. Um, so I would find, and, and Director Hughes can tell a little more about how maybe to do this, um, somebody at the top that can help with this. The second thing I would do is get on Google Scholar. Um, that's what I did. I knew nothing about corrections and the culture or anything like that before uh, coming into um, this job. And so get on Google Scholar and type in yoga in prison. And you will find a lot of the research and the street cred um, that you need to present. Um, and I know um, um, I'll share for whenever Director Hughes would say no to me, I would, <laughs> I would get on Google Scholar and I would send him a very long email citing the reasons why he should not say no to a proposal. I know he's shaking his head, yes. And this is, and statistics and things like that. And once you see it in black and white, um, it's hard, you know, to say no to that. Um, so, so Director Hughes, would you say top down Yes, I, it comes from the top down as much as you can. So, you know, each county is different in Maryland. Um, just like Sue, we, so we did the warden's round table and we had all the wardens from all, all the counties in Maryland there. And, and so, and there were some of the wardens I was like, so Sue, you're not gonna really get through to these. Um, they were, they were uh, 
they were just uh, like, well, they were Marines. And I said, you know, they're kind of strict. And then, you know, I don't know what they're going to, how you're going to take this class. And so they loved it because just like Sue, just because where she can show you or she does to me, if I question anything, she's going to bring it up to me and say, look at this. Now tell me how you feel about it. Um, but, you know, after the, they were all for it, um, now a couple of their counties weren't. So if you can't get the wardens, you might have to go to the commissioners and just show them some of the stats that Sue would have or somebody that would have. But as far as that, but I'm with you with the, so my, my wife's also a mental health social worker. I worked at uh, part-time at a, a local state hospital. Um, several of my officers worked at worked there. Um, I liked it because it, it showed that, you know, mental illness is something different than somebody just committing a crime, um, you know, because some people are really sick and, and is different. And so it, my officers are learning how to, to talk and to treat inmates with mental illness a lot better. And they, they, uh, they talk to the other officers. So yeah, the mental health issue is, a, is, is, a, is another issue um, because a lot of them don't belong in jails, but they're, they're, yeah, I know around here, a lot of them are homeless and it's like a safe place for them, but you know, it's not really a somebody with real mental health issues. It's a hard place to be for. And Laura, just to let you know, I, I muted your um, microphone just for a moment because you had some background noise, um, but just if you wanted to respond, just to let you know that you're on mute um, so you can unmute yourself. Um, if you wanted to continue to respond. And then I know that we had a second part to your question, which I'll direct at Sue, um, just kind of um, telling our audience about uh, the differences, like what specifically is trauma-informed yoga? And thank you, Director Hughes and Sue for your beautiful responses. Sure, you're welcome. So trauma-informed, um, the language is different than a regular uh, yoga class. It's more invitational. Um, also, you wanna create something called interoception. And that is understanding the parts of your body and being aware of them. One of the things that happens during trauma is because of all the cortisol and the adrenaline that's constantly being secreted into your brain, you, you lose touch with parts of your body. So for example, if you're always in a state of hypervigilance and jacked up, then you don't recognize um, when, when there's danger um, and you get that uh, feeling because you're always, uh. yeah. So we wanna try to connect people back with the parts of their body. So a lot of the language is asking people to notice things like, you know, like if I'm in warrior one, notice what's happening to your arms. Notice if your legs are starting to, to shake, you know, notice if you can feel your toes on the mat. Um, so it, it offers two things. One, it gives you an idea of getting, helps you get back connected with your body. And two, it keeps you in the focus of the here and now where you're not thinking about the past and you're not thinking about the future, but you're in the moment. And in the moment is the thing that causes the neurogenesis, the healing of the limbic system, the trauma part of your brain. And that's what makes it so, so powerful. Um, so that's kind of like the real basic cliff note version, if that's helpful to you, Laura. Can you hear me? Yep. I'm sorry about the background noise. Yes, that is super helpful. Thank you. Um, I feel like, you know, to be incarcerated, there's, there's like daily trauma, that cortisol, you know, you have the trauma that led to your incarceration and then, uh, then the, just the daily trauma of being there. Um, but thank you. And thank you, um, both of you and Director Hughes. I, I really appreciate your answer. And I think a round table concept is great. I think, like you said, the admin buy-in is so huge. Um, so I really like that was really helpful information. Thank you so much. 
Blair, if I could quickly just uh, just let folks know too. Um, so on the PYP end, I'm almost done with the training I'm developing for facilitators for how to develop a program. And in it, I created an annotated bibliography of all the um, studies on yoga and benefits for incarcerated folks. Wanted to tell you that too, Sue. <laughs> and so that exists. So I have a list of like 20 studies over the past two decades that highlight the benefits of yoga for people incarcerated that I'm happy to share with folks. And I am. Uh, um, drop my email in the chat. So just thought I'd share. <laughs> That's awesome. Thank you, Nicole, for doing that. And yeah, thank you, Nicole. I didn't know that you were working on that. Absolutely amazing. It's been um, a hidden project among my many projects. <laughs> <laughs> but I did one, one thing I wanted to mention that Sue mentioned that, that is knowing your body and, and part of the classes and stuff has taught the officers about recognizing when they're starting to lose, you know, get lose their temper or they're starting to know when to walk away. And, and so that's a big thing about it is knowing your body and knowing, you know, how you can calm yourself down and stuff. Thank you. And um, I, I, both of you have just given us incredible resources. Uh, Nicole, I'm really looking forward to sharing your resources with our community. Um, but just as far as for our audience as well, um, to let you know that we do a foundational training, um, which is, it dives into trauma-informed yoga. And it really talks about yoga for incarcerated people, yoga for correctional staff, right? So we're starting to establish the view through our foundational training. Um, and there's, it's a, it's self-paced on your own. Um, we offer videos, training materials, and then we also offer four two hour workshops where you get to sit with Bill and Nicole and we do um, embodiment of social activism. So, so we really use the body again in this trauma informed way to align ourselves with the work that we do here. So just to pitch um, a way that like, if this work is really something that you're wanting to get involved in and do more of that we offer a training. Um, so I have another question. Hi, Billy. Um, so Billy's talking about wanting to implement some programming. And I think here in LA as well um, for correctional officers and for some other um, facilities for some other kind of facilities, maybe like uh, mental health or addiction facilities. Um, the question is, how do you schedule offerings for CO staff? Are they on the clock or are they on personal time? Um, what tips might you have? Uh, what tips might you give to a yoga service provider trying to make a breakthrough towards implementing programming? So kind of these two questions, like um, almost like what's the package that you can create to uh, pitch these kind of programming? Do you wanna go first, Dr. Hughes? You want me to go first? You can go. Okay. Um, I think the first thing is you've gotta find that, that top level, administrative person um, who's willing to listen to you. Um, and the second thing is what, what, what helped me were statistics um, and neuroscience. The understanding of the why, you know, why does it work? Why can it be helpful to you? Why can it be helpful to your facility? And how can it help your correctional officers? Like that's how I approached it from, because then, like I said, it takes the wusa out of, out of things um, for people that might have some doubt that no, this is this is based on science. And I know, um, I think, and Director Hughes, you can talk a little more about it, but that's kind of what, um, how I got him into it. <laughs> so, um, cause there, there was skepticism, but it, uh, there should have been as so. So that's the first part. Um, I don't know, Director Hughes, do you have any? So yeah, it's a skepticism. It, it, you know, at first I was like, there's no way these guys are going to do any of this stuff. <laughs> um, and Sue came in there, well, we're going to do this and we're going to do this and this is going to work. And I was like, yeah, let's, let's see. I don't really think so, but you know, so that's why I walked by the, I said, I got to go by the library because that's where they were holding their class and I got, I'm going to watch this. And when I walked by and they were all doing it, I say, hmm, maybe there's something to this. And, and, and so, you know, it, the buy-in and, and all that, it was, 
it's there. I mean, she would always, but she was always backed up. I, if I had a, she was ready for me. So if I always was going to say, no, I'm not sure. Well, here it is right here. Let's, let's go over this, you know, and she would have the statistics and stuff. And I was like, okay, let's try it. Let's see what, how it goes. And, and, and so, but it worked. And uh, so, the, the approach, yeah, was yeah. that I was very different. It wasn't of like, listen, I know it, you can feel it, you know, it's like, no, here's the data. Because if you think about it, corrections is a very data driven um, organization. Um, and everybody, you know, especially with the Justice Reinvestment Act, is looking at how can we, you know, get our numbers better. You know, so if you present it with the data and the science behind it, and there's a lot of research out there, which Nicole, you know, I'm sure has them all on her, um, her bibliography of, of things um, that you can use uh, to support your reasoning behind it. It's just pulling it all together. Um, that is, it, that is the, the thing that's a little more more time consuming. I'm gonna jump in again, just cause I saw in Billy's question, something I hear from a lot of folks, which is like how you get them to show up. And I, I totally agree, like the science is the first step. And in terms of like logistically, can you speak a little bit more to that? Um, like just getting, cause it, it was mandated, right? It was a mandated training for, for, for the officers. For the correction officers, yeah. yeah. It, was, it was part of their, and how um, we marketed it, um, is that it was part of their yearly training and they need so many hours a year. And so Director Hughes, I think the first year I came in one hour one, and then two and then three, and then it went to a five hour class. Um, so it was a win-win. They needed the hours and I could help provide a training that was new and different. Also, you know, there's a big push with um, officer wellness right now. And so if I could say, oh, I wanna do something with officer wellness, you know, and talk about how it's gonna be really good if you have this for those that are incarcerated in your facility. You know what I mean? So that was like the second part. Um, so that's how I orchestrated um, the presentation. Um, so, so yes, it was man mandatory, but then they asked for it, you know, once a month, well, actually more than that, but you know, once a month on work time. Um, so, and I think, am I missing anything director or is that? And with correction officers, so, you know, they're stuck behind walls. And, and so they're not used to people coming from the outside to train, to do anything. It's always the other officers that train. It's really tight. You don't let nobody in. And I think that was a big thing, just trying to get. And Sue and them, when they came in, they came in with the attitude. I know uh, trauma yoga. I know mental health stuff. I don't know corrections. And they didn't come in trying to tell us, you know, how to do our job. They tried, they came in trying to learn. And I think that's how the officers connected with them. Because if you come in, you know, I, I know better than you. I got this degree. I got that degree. You know, they got the, the jail degree. They got working on the, the pods and stuff. And so they were very not so up to, you know, if you come in with the attitude, and I think it helps when people come in from the outside with a, a different attitude, like, I don't know everything. You teach me and I'll teach you. And I think that's how it all came along really good. You know, we check ourselves. Every time I come in, I, I think of myself as a guest. And any day I could be asked not to come back. Um, it's not my house, <laughs> not my house, not my rules, you know, so, um, and I, I think that that was, was appreciated, um, by the correctional officers. And I actually even hear that like your approach to everything was also trauma informed, you know, it's like knowing your audience. Yes. You're like, okay, like I know that these are the people who are going to be serving, this is the information that I want to present, right? That you presented it in a non-hierarchical -hierarch way, right? And it's like, this is mutually beneficial. Yes. And this is why. Yes. Uh -huh. And tons of data and statistic driven, you know? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I have a couple questions from Carol that I wanted to weave into here too. Um, were all the yoga classes slash programs voluntary or were they required? Um, 
And, and then a kind of a, a different question is how many people that were able to take your yoga class, uh, what was the max number of people that you have in your classes? And I'm guessing pre, pre COVID. Right. So we can start with just talking about those for that are incarcerated. The max number that I'm allowed to have in, in the gym is 14. And what we did is it's a six week class. So if you finish, you know, you have to attend every single class, um, then you can get a certificate, which is beneficial for court. Um, and, um, and then if you wanted to stay in the class, um, you can stay in the class for as long as you want. We had one guy in it for over a year, just repeating everything. Because the, for those that are incarcerated, the education portion is like 30 minutes. Um, and then we do an hour on the mat. And, you know, little blurps, because I recognize that their cortisol is just being secreted constantly. Um, and, you know, that getting information and having it stick um, isn't necessarily going to be there for everybody just because of their own levels of trauma. Um, so it, when it, it was totally voluntary. Words just spread quickly. You know, it became like it was the most popular class in the jail. It just became really hard to get into. Um, so that was a big deal if they, you know, if you were able to get into it just because of the number of requests. So that was completely voluntary. Now, like what we said with the correctional officers, they were voluntold. Um, and initially it was like a little, ooh, but now I don't think they they detested as much as what they did back in 2018. <laughs> yeah, no, they, they do, they like it now. So they don't really complain. And a lot of them ask for extra classes. So. And I try to make it really fun. You know, a lot of videos, discussion, things like that. And where we had it limited to a certain amount, the one guy that was in there for a year, he was go back to his pod and then he was holding class at night. So he was teaching all the yoga to the guys in the back at nighttime and stuff. So, cause he was, yeah. Wow. And initially, um, and I just saw in the chat from Nancy, um, who I'm a big fan of, who really was instrumental in helping us um, set up our PYP program that, um, that I would teach the correctional officer portion of the class with another CO. So thanks for mentioning that, Nancy. I appreciate that, which just really helped. So um, Captain Rogers and I would do the training together. Um, and it was great because he could talk about, you know, some of the reactions of the brain on being on the job for years and years and normalize it. Because, you know, let's be honest, you're really going to listen to one of your own before you're going to listen to the little social worker that comes in. So, so that was super helpful as well. Thanks for mentioning that, Nancy. <laughs> I'm hearing like the word that comes up for me is support, just that there's support everywhere. And uh, just to say, Sue, as well, what I think I really like that you've created with your class is that they're not dropping classes. I like that you've created this container, right? That it's kind of the certificate program and you're starting somewhere and you're finishing somewhere and you're, you're allowing people to leave with tools. Mm -hmm. You know what you're wanting to get across and you know what you're wanting to offer. Um, and then it allows other people to kind of come in and get these tools. Yes. Um, so I think that's actually something really special that you've created. And um, oh, yeah, I think that's really cool. Yeah. Um, I have another question from Carol. Um, so from outside of the jail, um, did you need authorization or funds from the county or state um, for this kind of programming? Um, for the correctional officers or for those that are incarcerated? Um, let's do correctional officers. It's not specified, but I'll, I'll, we'll, we'll say correctional officers first. No. <laughs> I mean, um, I, I give props to um, Nancy, who is in charge of, you know, PYP Maryland, who got us our yoga mats, you know, to help start with, with those that are incarcerated. And that's pretty much what we needed. We had some startup money where we could order some blocks and some straps, um, you know, but for that, for the correctional officers, there's absolutely no cost besides maybe some donuts to bring in. Um, but it, everything's PowerPoint and everything is, you know, with the mats that we already had. So um, Director Hughes really liked that. It, <laughs> it was like, it was free essentially. Uh, so I think that answers. Yeah, well, we're lucky to have Sue because she uh, 
she does it all on her own time. So she, she's just great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Amazing. So I'm hearing like a, a low overhead kind of cost for these programs, right? It's, and yep. I mean, yeah. maybe a few handouts, PowerPoint and yoga mats, and that's it, which, you know, makes it really nice, very affordable. <laughs> And we have a, a question from Sue Julian. Um, so I think this is directed towards you to the other Sue as well. Um, so does every, the, within the container of your yoga class, does every yoga class include info on trauma and the brain? Um, and, or do you also include yoga philosophy? Do you, do you weave any uh, yoga philosophy into the class as well? So the, most of the class is the watered down version with the correctional Officers. Um, so, um, you know, we talk about the brain and ACEs. We talk about identifying your where you feel things in your body. Um, and we also included a portion for addiction and understanding how, you know, yoga and meditation can help with addiction. There's a little bit that I weave into um, about yoga philosophy, most of it comes from, because every participant gets a, a PYP book, um, you know, the James Fox book. Um, not a lot. It's something that I would like to start doing a little bit more of. Um, I think initially, you know, I, I was just like, okay, let's base it on the science and then I can expand and ex extrapolate a little bit. Um, so, so not an awful lot more so when I'm on the mat where, um, you know, is where, and I bring that, that kind of stuff in, but it doesn't usually come in, in the, in the lecture part of the, of the class. Awesome. Thanks, Sue. Mm -hmm. Um, and then, uh, I just kind of have a, have a statement from Cindy, uh, Cindy that I'd like to read. And then I'm going to do, um, one, the last question will be from or for Priscilla, they've got their hand raised. Um, and then this, this comment from Cindy is, thank you for all of the valuable information you've provided today. As a formerly incarcerated person, I know firsthand the impact of yoga and how it had on my time behind bars. I'm about to begin my RYT training. So this webinar was a great way to start. Thank you again. Awesome, Cindy. And congratulations for starting your, uh, and continuing your yoga journey. Thank you. That's wonderful. Yes. Good luck to you, Cindy. That's awesome. You're going to come in with such a wealth of information. It's going to be so much easier for you. I'm sure that it was for me. <laughs> and uh, Priscilla, uh, you're welcome to ask your question now. Thank you for being here. Thanks, Blair. Um, thank you all so much. Thank you, Director Hughes, Sue, and Blair, and everyone at PYP for doing this. It's like, this is really such a heartening um, think to be a part of. And I just want to, before I ask the question, just say that I'm doing the foundational training right now and it's incredible and I can't say enough amazing things about it. So since y'all brought it up, I just wanted to, <laughs> to say that because it's like, it's really been life-changing for me. Um, I had, my brother was mentally ill and incarcerated for a bit. And, and then my dad was also incarcerated and deported. And it's something that I literally like pretended didn't happen. And then I uh, didn't talk about and then this like completely opened up this um, this connection with PIP has been tremendous for me and also completely pulling together my interest um, in the law as a lawyer and as a yoga teacher and it's just like incredible <laughs> so, so yeah so I am just like my heart is beating really fast right now because this is all like so unbelievably exciting and I just I it's touched on it before. This is kind of a question for Director Hughes um, and, and Sue. Um, I'm really curious about, I understand that there are, uh, like obviously we're, we are talking about the benefits and we know, and this is something that, you know, if we could, we could do it all the time. And there's real life constraints, especially in um, the prison or jail. And I'm curious as to what you can speak to about how to decide like when how often, um, what are those kind of factors in offering these classes? And I know, I understand the statistics are wonderful and beautiful on what the effects it has, the positive effects. And I'm curious just about like, the director, he was like day to day, like, what do you see in the people? And I'm like, and how do they, like you said, one person would take it and then, um, he would do classes and I totally recognize we have three minutes left. So whatever you could say, I would appreciate. Thank you again so much. 
So yeah, so that that inmate actually went to another state, and he he wrote me a letter back and, and saying how much he appreciated the classes and and how it affected him, and and he was the one that actually was going back to the pods and teaching the guys yoga and in, in, in the evenings and stuff. So, um, two. <laughs> Yeah, um, Priscilla, I wonder if you could help me out a little bit. I know you said a lot, like specifically the, the question just about. I'm curious as like how, I think you said you offer the class monthly. So, I'm, so two parts is one is like, how did you set on when and how often? And then also what is it that you see that, you know, if you're only there once a month, they're there the rest of the time. Like what, what do they do? Like how, what do you see? um happening yeah i guess it's not it's so a super clear question i think it's just as clear as i can articulate <laughs> okay. it right now okay. so the correctional officer class for the co's is can going to continue um monthly the um the course that i do for those that are incarcerated is a weekly class so that is held every week so there's a little got it there. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I really try to schedule it like if I have court, you know, if I can't come on my regular Thursday, then I work with Director Hughes. Can I come another time during the week so that there isn't a gap of, of any of the of the services? And we try to do, you know, um, have people in it as long as we can, since like depending on what research you read, you know, 10 to 12 weeks of, um, you know, weekly trauma-informed yoga is the, is the sweet spot to help um, with the neurogenesis of the brain. And so, and, and it's really been neat. Like, you know, the problem isn't people coming to class. The problem is, is we don't have enough yoga instructors <laughs> for, to meet the need. So I'm so glad that you're in it and involved in it and um, are willing to, you know, provide this service. Um, and to speak to that, like, yoga, and I know we're at the end, Blair, but I, I notice a few things come up in messages I received just about funding, because I think part of why we don't always have enough yoga teachers to fulfill this is we do need funding for folks that like aren't on staff or working with the facilities to be able to continue to bring them in. So I just wanted to acknowledge that to folks like in this virtual space that we very much do intend to ask for funding for this work across the country and sustain it so that a diverse group of people can um, be doing this work and I see Sue and director who's both nodding their heads so again I just wanted to acknowledge that um yeah. that that is part of the work and the research right so that we can do those things absolutely I mean that's part of the reason why we engage in the research with you know Dr. Hayden Smith like the more we can get out about how valuable this is um you know let's pay our yoga instructors, you know, um, to come in and, and, and do this. And the payment that they would receive, you know, the benefits as Director Hughes has talked about would far, you know, make up for, you know, whatever you give the, the, the stipend for the yoga instructor. I just see it as it's only a matter of time because the research is there, like it's really there. And we just wanted, you know, our research to help contribute with that. Um, to, to get more people um, into the facility and be paid for their time. Yeah, and I think y'all even acknowledge the highlight, which is the actual overhead or like the supplies you need are so minimal, right? Like it, it's, it really is still, either way you look at it, uh, an inexpensive program. So I did appreciate y'all sharing that, right? It's, it's human relationship, which doesn't yeah. cost anything. We just have to get those humans um, in the door, but I, I appreciate that as well. And there's, there's yeah. a lot of people out there wanting to the help and that will donate money, donate books. I get it from the state. Um, I got books, children's books. They sent me when they, when they heard about the program we had, they sent books. Um, some of them, I even, the Dolly Parton books, we get them even. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, we, there's a lot of people out there wanting to help too. So. And I just want to say, Priscilla, thank you also for sharing your story and your work. And thank you for being here with the Prison Yoga Project. 
Um, and we are gonna wrap. So if you had any questions, I'm sorry that we didn't get to you. Um, maybe we can have Sue and Director Hughes on again, maybe after the summer, and we can talk more about this programming uh, since it started up. And I actually wanna give you guys the floor last and then I'll do some housekeeping to kind of round it up. Um, Director Hughes, you know, we wanna honor your time. So thank you both so much for being here. This was really an incredible conversation. So thank you for showing up and thank you for the work that you do. Um, maybe if you just wanna leave us with any last statements um, or anything, a story, anything that you want to share? Um, Boy, I have one. Yeah, of course. And it, yeah. Okay. So the last feel good story. It was, um, I remember um, one time when, when Director Hughes was uh, coming in after the end of the parenting class to tell these two individuals um, that they would be able to have a face-to-face -face visit with their kids. And that's not something that's ever done in Dorchester County Detention Center. Everything is through the glass. Um, and it was incredible. The one man's charges was, were murder. The other one was um, robbery. And all of a sudden, the tears started. Um, they could not believe that something so generous was done into a facility. And um, so Director Hughes left very quickly <laughs> when that started. But what was amazing to me is that the one man said, um, I think there's something wrong with my heart. Um, and after processing through, what it was was a sense of like gratitude that in a facility where he's always had his guard up and, and you know, just ready to throw down and saw um, the correctional officers as a we they thing, um, he, he felt compassion and he could not believe the generosity of the warden. And, you know, he was having that heart flutter and, you know, just not knowing that it wasn't a heart attack. It was just that wonderful feel good um, thing that you get when another person reaches out and does something compassionate. So um, that's my feel good story. I know, do you remember that, director? Oh, I remember it. Cause he also said that nobody's ever done anything for him. Yes. Do you remember that? And, and so that was another thing that like pushes you to say, you know, yeah. I could affect this person. Who else can I help? You know, it's just, just doing the right thing or doing a nice thing just to, you can, it affects people in ways you don't realize. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And we'll close on that. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you both for being here. Um, I really like that, that last statement. Um, Director Hughes of just like, who else can I help, right? It's like, okay, like I, I, I'm seeing a difference and I feel like that's just this kind of continual question. And I feel like I can kind of see that that's like the way that you walk through the world and that's the way that you walk through your facility and you too, Sue, right? It's like, okay, and you're just, you're just, you're continuing to go, right? Like who can I help next? Um, so again, thank you both for being here. Thank you for the work that you do. Um, we're really excited to see the work published uh, and really happy to hear that this programming is continuing. Um, just to plug in a couple things uh, about Prison Yoga Project. Um, we have our foundational training and thank you Priscilla for coming in and giving that beautiful uh, verbal uh, testimony of, uh, of our training too. So if this is work that you're interested in, um, please join us. Um, you know, it's really an honor to sit in this seat and um, be part of a community and really a community of people that are doing this work um, that are knowledgeable, that have wisdom. Um, it's really exciting to see all of the work that's happening. Um, we are also launching our own yoga teacher training. So if this is a path that you have wanted to walk down before, um, it's starting June 1st, and we do still have a few positions and spots open. Um, the yoga teacher training is focused on social justice and leadership. Um, so it's all trauma-informed um, and really about how, how do we become yoga teachers for outside of a studio setting, right? I think we all really know the power of yoga and we want to create more opportunities, more holistic opportunities like Sue and Director Hughes have done. Um, so that's really what our, our training is about. Um, we have a new series being launched and it's for um, paying community web members on our website. And our founder, James Fox, is doing a Dharma series starting this Friday. Nicole is gonna drop the link in there. Um, and it's kind of this idea of um, the idea, the show is called Prajna. And uh, the first program is Karma Yoga. 
So really about how do we, again, th that question of um, who do I serve next? How can I help, right? And so that's this path of karma yoga. Um, let me look to see if there's anything else in my notes. Uh, we have our foundational training. Um, oh, also uh, Sue mentioned that we have books and that you give our books to the people that are in your programming. Um, we have uh, both books available for, available for purchase. We have James' first book, and then we have a new book out specifically for um, incarcerated women um, and just kind of the differences in how we can support women that are incarcerated. Um, again, thank you so much for being our first guest on Healing Harm and um, this transformative justice series. It was an absolute honor to have you both. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm.